All right. I want to share my screen and we will get started here. Okay. So welcome everyone. If you're if you're new to Five Miles from Anywhere, we are an international Sherlock Holmes Science Society. We always meet uh, on Zoom. Um, we meet about you know we, we the first Saturday of every month, um, unless there's uh, something comes up. We might not do it every month in the summer. Sometimes we take a hiatus, uh, but we meet regularly at this time um, on this day. So if you're interested in just joining us, it doesn't, you just show up and you're officially a member. <laughs> we haven't done any membership stuff, but that maybe we'll talk about that next meeting, actually. So for today, um, just I'll start with a few announcements because I always do. Then we will get uh, what everyone's here for, the London tour of the Redheaded League or highlights from it uh, by Robin. Uh, and then we'll have a bit of time for discussion. So I think everyone's very excited about this one, Robin. So thank you so much for, for agreeing to, to give us a talk today. So a couple of announcements. Um, if you uh, are part of a science society or if you're just interested or know of a library, the Beacon Society um, just pro started providing uh, basic components of a library display that you can use at, your, uh, at a community or school library to further the importance of reading Sherlock Holmes, uh, including students. So students can access this too. And you can see this kind of really cool display here. Um, if you're interested in that, you can contact Steve Mason. You remember he gave our talk uh, last month on the Sherlockian autographs. And there's his email there. Um, already a couple of the boxes have been claimed, but definitely contact him because it's a really cool way uh, to spread uh, Sherlock Holmes to others. And I think it would be great if we get more of those boxes out there. Um, and if you don't know, the Beacon Society is a nonprofit um, science society, and their whole purpose is getting students uh, and youth, especially interested in Sherlock Holmes, to keep um, Holmes alive. It's a it's an awesome group. I highly recommend if you don't know them to, to check them out. Okay. Uh, Coming up in a week, yeah, next weekend is the 221 Beacon in Atlanta. So um, if you are going, awesome. If you are interested, I do still think you can still go. So check that out if you're interested. And then in May, in about a month, is the DePaul Pop Culture Conference in uh, Chicago. Um, and that should, this year they're doing a celebration of Sherlock Holmes uh, for their conference. Uh, Tom Yui is like one of the big keynote speakers. Uh, so it's real exciting. If you know Tom, he's great. He's a Canadian, uh, Sherlockian, and um, I'm sure it's going to be an awesome talk. Um, so if you're interested in that, it, it's free to attend if you're in uh, Chicago. So definitely um, check that out. And then, I, and I know Andrew uh, is on here, so I just wanted to give him a thank you that uh, earlier this month, I spoke to the Cheshire Sherlock Holmes Society on solar ponds uh, and they made me a member. Uh, so I was very excited uh, about that. Uh, they're a great group. If you are interested in going to one of their talks, um, they're like usually mid month, midday. Um, and I believe that they are gonna continue doing it. They've been virtual, but I think they're doing a hybrid format now. Um, and, and it's really a fun group. So I highly recommend they gave me the investiture of the book merchant, which I thought was very, you know, I was very humbled by it. I thought it was very cool. And I highly recommend uh, if you haven't joined them at least once, see if you can contact Andrew and uh, zoom on in. All right. Uh, well, it looks like there's some stuff in the chat, some of you guys are saying, it uh, looks like Josh is gonna be at the 221 Beacon in DePaul. Um, and looks like uh, the, the DePaul conference is the same time as the Christopher Morley lunch in Philadelphia. So I guess one of the things that, oh, it's, it's really great about all these Sherlockian events is you, you, they, on the downside, they usually conflict with each other. On the plus side, I think everybody loves that you always have options, which is great. 
All right. So um, I'm going to turn uh, it over now to Robin. Um, oh, you know what? I stopped my presentation a touch too soon. I just realized. I do want to share my screen one more time. Okay, because I do have a slide here on Robin. There he is. All right. Um, and I'm going to just read a brief intro uh, for Robin here. So Robin Rolls is a qualified city of London guide lecturer and historian with a portfolio of guided walks that include the London connections to H.G. Wells, Doctor Who, the English Civil War, and of course, Sherlock Holmes. Robin studied history at Birkbeck University of London before training as a, as a city guide. He has contributed articles for the Journal of the Sherlock Holmes Society of London, the Gazette of Le Circle Holmes uh, Parisian, and Proceedings of the Pondicherry Lodge for the Sherlock Holmes Society of India. His nonfiction writings include The Civil War in London, Voices from the City, published by Pen and Sword Press. Uh, he also had a short story in Sherlock Holmes of Baking Street, um, which was published by Belanger Books. And uh, you can tweet him on Twitter at Sherlock Walks. So uh, let's give a, a virtual round of applause to Robin. And uh, you're going to be on, my friend. Okay. Okay, I'm just going to start sharing now. So do bear with me. Where is it? If you have any technical difficulties, just let me know, Robin. I can do my best to walk you through it. Yeah, I'm just trying to find my PowerPoint. Oh, can you see it? Not yet. You might need oh, to screen. I don't, I don't know what I've done wrong then. Hang on. Let's minimize that. Because I'm not. I think you're going to have to walk me through this. Okay. Did you click the share screen button? I did. And I've, I've just clicked, on, I've just tried to find the PowerPoint, but it's not coming up. So. When you see, when you click on the share screen, it should have one of the options as the PowerPoint. It should be you should see mm. the screen you're on now and a couple others. Is the PowerPoint open? The PowerPoint is open. Uh, ah. You got it. Hang on. Mm -hmm. Okay, we see a male privacy protection screen now. <laughs> is that what uh, you're doing? okay? Hang on. I think I'll, I'll close down some of the surplus windows. Okay. Right, so if I close oh, that's the back window, so now get back to new, uh, new share, and I've lost the PowerPoint. Is it at the bottom of your screen? One of the options there? Um, Zoom. This top one, white ball. Oh dear. I'm not, I'm not having much luck today. I, I should be I should be able to see it on the on the on the window, but I can't. So is it oh can you oh there you go. There it is. Oh excellent. Yep, there you go. Just click on it and it should open up now. Nope. Uh, nope. But is it back there? It was. If you go back. Hang on. Okay. Let me just reverse what I did just now. Yeah. Oh, come on. Oh, dear. Just, uh, if you go back, it was it was showing up. If you go, go to the top where it says file. So yeah. Click on that. Open recent. Okay. And they go to Redheaded League, uh, or just go to Open Recent, maybe. Yeah, I've opened Recent, but it's great. It's great out. You have to okay, you go, have go to, to Recent on your. First. You have to yeah. cancel first. Yeah, cancel now. Try it. Then go to Recent. Yeah, set the top of his file. There you go. This then should go. do it. Right. Oh, okay, excellent! So you got it. <laughs> okay. So. Go to 
Sherlock Holmes investigates the Red Headed League, presented go to, go by myself. Show. Sorry? Go to slideshow and then. Uh, uh, oh, of course, yes, yeah, sorry. Covering on my Mac, the, the tall bar keep intruding. There you go. Ah, oh, you can see it now. And then play from start. Hit play from start. Right. Okay, I'll start again. Sherlock Holmes investigates the red-headed league presented by myself with a little help from my good friend, Dr. Anita Butler, who went around and helped me take the photos. So, this is, this is Jabez Wilson, who played by Roger Hammond from the ITV Granada series in the, in the, in the 1980s. And he looked very, very convincing as this um, elderly pawnbroker who, who has a struggling, um, a struggling business in Saxe Coburg Square. Now, this consultation is, is, is taking place in, in Baker Street, but it's, it, logistically, it's very difficult for me to do that on my walk. So, Having, assemb having assembled my party at Blackfriars Tube Station, we walk up to the Blackfriar, the Blackfriar pub, um, and we, we, we pretend this is the Baker Street sitting room. This is a, a genuine piece of Victorian art, Victoriana. It was built on the site of the old Blackfriars Monastery and in, in, and in, in, in the um, eight, 1870s. And so it's just possible that Holmes or Watson may have stopped off to have a, a quick pint on the way back to Baker Street. So Mr. Wilson starts telling Holmes on Watson his extraordinary story about his unusual employment and his very, very unusual assistant who, who came at half wages so as, so as to learn the job. This is, this, is, this, is, this is Mr. Vincent Spaulding, very, very lively, very quick witted, very good at his work. Um, but Wilson notes that he should be improving his mind um, instead of snapping away, snapping away with a camera. In, in the uh, Victorian age, you were supposed to improve yourself. And you see the picture here. Of the, of, of the institutes for institutes for um, ad, adult learning, which was intended to teach people um, craft and trade, and to protect them from what they call the evils that pervade our society. In other words, drinking in the pubs. Okay, as we as we as we move through the city, there are there are a few um, pleasant digressions. You see there the spire of St Bride's Church, which is known as the Cathedral of Fleet Street, is also the Wedding Cake Church, because, because the baker that designed it based, based the design on, on, the, on the spire of, of the spire of the, of, the, of the church. And it's also the journalist church, um, because up in the, in the church itself, there is the, there is the journalist chapel dedicated to all the memory of the, of the journalists who have been killed on, on, on overseas assignment. And the, picture, and the picture to the right is Salisbury Square, which has a very, very literary which has um, a very history. Um, Samuel, Samuel Pepys was born in Salisbury Square. And Samuel Richardson also, also, also lived there for a while. And it, it was the headquarters of the Society for Christian Knowledge. But most importantly, this is also page one of Sherlock Holmes history, because this was with the offices of Wald Lock and Company, which published Beaton's Christmas Annual in 1887. Um, the, square, the square was very damaged, badly damaged during World War II bombing. And after, after, and after the war, the, uh, the, the publishing industry moved west up, in, up into Piccadilly. Okay. So as we know from the story, Vincent Spaulding shows Mr. Wilson the advert in the Daily Chronicle about a vacancy in the League for Red-Headed Men. 
and persuades him to go to visit the office offices in, in, in Pope's court, which, which I strongly believe, based on my researches, to be to be in Poppins Court. And I don't know if you can see on the map, but it's just it's just it's just north of um, Fleet Street. And as and as and as we know, Fleet Fleet Street was choked um, with, with redheads of all of all kinds. And, and um, we see we see here Mr. Mr. Duncan Ross in interviewing Mr. Wilson. And the first thing he does is he pulls his hair to make sure he's not wearing a wig. Mr. Wilson gets the job, of course, but he's utterly bamboozled when he's told his duties are to copy out the Encyclopedia Britannica. And even though he's being paid a princely sum of four pounds a week, which is about 500 pounds a week in today's money, he has to buy his own pen and paper. So, so it wasn't it wasn't a very generous um, job job situation after after all of that. Now we know we know that Wilson was working there for eight weeks because he's he's he tells Sherlock Holmes that he's written about abbots and architecture and and Attica and hope with diligence to get onto the bees before very long. There's only one slight problem with that. It has been estimated that to get through an entire chapter of the Encyclopedia Britannica, working for only four day, four hours a day over eight weeks, you're, you're producing 6.4 million words, which is, a, which is an average of 528 words per minute. And that's with a, and that's with a dip fountain pen. That, that is some extraordinary feat of writing. Okay, sorry. So, anyway, this all comes to the an, an end on the 9th of October when Mr. Mr. Wilson go to the offices, no no doubt help to get, get collect his four four pounds, only to see the note stuck to the door. The red headed league is dissolved, and straight away he goes to, he goes to see the landlord, who 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 has never heard of the red headed league. And he explains about copying out the Encyclopedia Britannica. And if you watch the Douglas Wilmer TV version, there's a delicious scene where the manager simply looks at him and says, well, surely it's cheaper to buy it. Okay. However, Mr. Wilson perseveres and he, find, he finds out that the, the, the league has actually moved to an, to an office in King Edward Street. And he hurries around there I need to find that the address given is a manufactory of artificial kneecaps. So this joke is now starting to wear a bit thin, and so and so he consults consults Sherlock Holmes, who simply advises him to go and walk in the park for a few hours, and I'll, I'll have an answer for you on Monday. And then and then and then and then Holmes asks Watson to to be very quiet. He said, this is a three-pipe problem. Please do not disturb me for 50 minutes. At the end of the 50 minutes, Holmes takes Watson on a ramble through London. And straight away, we hit a small but vital plot point that few people have um, picked, picked upon. We travelled by underground to Aldersgate, which is now Barbican, and a short walk to Saxe Coburg Square. This is only one of two stories in which the underground plays a plot part, the other being the Bruce Partington plans. But why take the tube? Well, to my mind, it's quite it's, it's quite simple. Taking a taking a hansom cab to Saxe Coburg Square and then alighting is about as subtle as taking the police car of the Simon Blazing. Whereas by taking the train, it's just two gentlemen out for an afternoon stroll. And I place I, I place Bridgewater, sorry, Saxe Coburg Square in Bridgewater Square, which, which, which is now which is now part of, of the of the Barbican Estate. On the on the northeast boundary of the, of this of the city of London.
now, Doctor, we have done our work and, and, and we can play. The work they have undertaken is to, ma is to map out the terrain and also, also to have a look, also to have a look at Vincent Spaulding. Holmes knocks on the door and asks the direction to the strand. Third right, fourth left. There is no way, even, even if you could reconstruct 1890s London, you can get you can get from the Barbican to the Strand by follow, following those directions. However, that is not that is not Holmes's purpose, as, as we will as we will see later. And the and the play and the play that Holmes talks about is to go to St James's Hall and he immerse himself in violin music. And as it and, and as it says in the BBC radio version. Um, with Clive, with Clive Merrison. It is a German program. German music is very introspective. And this afternoon, I would introspect. And as we know, the party reassembles at Baker Street with, with the assistance of Inspector Jones and Mr. Merriweather, who is the director of the City and Suburban Bank which abuts onto the back of the row of houses in which the pawn shop is. And we have a sort of stakeout in the, in the, vaults, of, in the vaults of the bank. And as it happens, there is actually a bank on Aldersgate Street um, near, near the Barbican, but it's on the wrong side of the road. But that's easily explained. Conan Doyle didn't adjust his narrative to fit the geography. He adjusted the ge geography to fit the narrative. A bit, a bit, a bit like changing the facts to fit the theories, but all in a good cause. It it helps the story along. And of course, sitting there in the dark, suddenly up comes the floor tile, and who pops up? Vincent Spaulding, Spaulding, alias John Clay. And he, and the reason he he was he was there. He'd been tunneling through. To get it to get it, the, the French Napoleons, which the bank was holding to strengthen its collateral. Case closed. So that was very short and sweet, but please do keep it, please do keep in touch and, and I'll be taking questions in, in, in a moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Raman. Um, and I'm, I'm Probably good. It was uh, short and sweet because I think um, a lot of us probably have questions for you. Okay. All right. So, um, if anyone would like to uh, ask Robin a question, a um, couple just you can unmute and ask. Um, if it gets to the point where kind of bunch of people are jumping in. I'll try to keep track so I can see who has questions. Uh, and um, we can we can do that. And hopefully also kind of get a good discussion of the story uh, as we're going along here. Um, does anybody have a question uh, for Robin to start us off? Feel free just to jump on in at this point. Unmute yourself and jump on in. I'll go. Hey. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I've I've been over there several times, uh, three times, just to go pretty much to home sites, and <clears throat> excuse me, for for this story, um, I had gone to Charterhouse Square, uh, for Saxe Coburg Square, and I'd gone to Mitre Court instead of Poppins Court, so I just wondered what you thought of those sites. Right, um, uh, 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 Charter, Charter, Charter House Square for Saxe Coburg Square doesn't doesn't actually work, um, and, I've, and I've consulted scholarship on this. Um, the reason it doesn't work is, is it's too grand because in in Charter House Square you have 18th century merchants' houses, including the ambassador to the Baltic trade, and it's although it, it has um. The, the, the green the green little, little green verge it, it it was probably rather too smart and posh to, to have a, a somewhat down at heel pawnbroker shop um 
might have, might have caught I did consider, but the but the but the weight of evidence does 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 suggest it's Poppin J Court because that that would that would have been a, a a much shorter walk for Mr Wilson because he he was he he wasn't a young man and he, his walk from Saxe Coburg Square to Poppins Court would have would have taken him at least twenty five minutes and it would have been a much longer walk that could get that go to to mitre court. Does that help? Well, I don't agree, but uh, I understand your reasoning. That's fine. Robin, I had a question. Um, mm. By having you give this talk, I, I found, um, when I reread the Red Headed League before this, I really found myself looking at locations much more than I ever had before. And it's interesting how many locations uh, are in this particular story and how um, important in a sense, the uh, locations are to, to the story, as you, you've said about your walk. Um, I was wondering about the vegetarian restaurant because that always kind of strikes me, you know, it's 19th century London and there's a, you know, they mentioned that they go past a vegetarian restaurant. Was any idea where that might've been located and was it common to have a vegetarian restaurant in London in the 19th century? Right. Um, I, I, can, I, can, I, I haven't I identified roughly where the vegetarian restaurant would have been, but I can tell you that um, vegetarianism was um, a thing in, the, in, in England since the 17th century. And, 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 and of course, then, there was there was various health movements that have advocated people being vegetarian throughout the 18th and 19th centuries so it, it would not have been that uncommon cool thank you i was again that was kind of a surprising one <laughs> um other questions tom just an observation i wonder if it might have been an indian restaurant since vegetarianism is so prevalent in India, and since so many um, Englishmen had gone to India and spent time there, kind of a built-in clientele. Um, yes, that is that is quite that is perfectly feasible. Um, I think I'm um, also think bearing in mind that. Um, what Watson was in Asia, and it's quite possible that ret returning soldiers might have picked up the habit of um, eat eating curries. It's a very good point. We have a question in the chat uh, wondering how much it would have cost uh, Jabez Wilson there to um, buy the paper and, and, and the supply his own paper and pen in that time period. How much would that have cut into his profits? Um, that I'm not sure about. We 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 know that he bought a pennyworth bottle of ink, and um, seven sheets of foolscap. Um, so, so it, it, it um, paper and ink was was relative was relatively cheap then, so it, it wouldn't it wouldn't have diminished them by that by that much. There is a there is a reference at the end of the story. Where, where Holmes says that um, you, you you still have thirty pounds of, of the of the thirty two pounds he, he he would have been paid, so it's, it's it's not it's not a great dent in his profits. That's good to know. <laughs> All right, Susan, you've got a question there. Yeah, I don't know that you need to be looking for. A Indian vegetarian restaurants in London. It was a massive movement and one of its chief proponents was um, George Bernard Shaw. Mm. If you take a look on the internet, Dorian Nash has already put in one URL for you. There are any number of scholarly articles talking about vegetarianism in England and particularly in London during the time period. Yes, I meant to mention GBS. Um, he, he was he was um, quite a, a pusher for people not not eating meat. Uh, 
I'm interested in knowing about the underground more. What what was the technology that was used, and um, how how prevalent was it? How how far did it go? Um, the, well, the, the, well, the tube started in 1863. The line the lines were, weren't as developed as 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 they, as they, as they were now. The, um, the Metropolitan Line was 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 the, was the first line. And it, and it went from, I think, Pad, I think it went from Pad, Pad, Paddington down down to down to about Liverpool Street, as 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 it, as it does as it does now. And it would have been it would have been steam trains, but in the in the in the eighteen nineties there was a gradual transition over to electric trains. But but it but but it still wouldn't it still wouldn't have been um, a comfortable experience. Not 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 that travelling on the tube is necessarily a comfortable experience nowadays. But but the tra the trains would have would have been dirty and smelly, as they are sometimes now. So and it, and it would have been like sort of wood, wood, wooden carriages. And th and this of course explain this of course explains the um, the tweed phenomenon. Um, when, when you went on a train, you, you, you wore travelling clothes to keep you to keep your good clothes nice. And and tweed and tweed is also an insulator because trains were either too hot or too cold. But fortunately for our heroes, the the, the journey from Baker Street round round to Barbican is a short one. It's it's, it's only about ten minutes. How about the uh, the uh, um, fake kneecap factory there? <laughs> any was there is it, <laughs> any information on that? Right, yeah, that was that was an invention by um, Arthur Conan Doyle. In fact, in fact, it was a a a, a, funeral, a funeral store where where you would buy the black drapes and all the paraphernalia you you, you had you, you wanted for a funeral. And in, and and la and later on, it became the headquarters of the London of the London Post Office. So the and and, and so the, the 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 artificial kneecap factory was just, was just a quirky bit of humour, thrown in by ACD, possibly related to the fact that Bart's Hospital is, is just around the corner. Other question. Well, oh. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, well, that that brings up my question of if Bart's is just around the corner, does your tour, do you dovetail into other uh, stories of the canon while you're doing this? Or, um, I mean, you could really oh. just. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, there is, there, is, there, is, there is a lot more. Um, time, time actually doesn't allow me to go into much detail, but the area of Smithfield um just just in front just in front of Bart's I, I I have um named it Sherlock's treasure chest because there <laughs> because there are so many connections range, ranging from the Robert Downey Jr. film to to a study in to a study in Scarlet and come and, and, and then coming back up the timeline to Sherlock and all, and all, and also his also his 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 last bow Right, right, and the and, and the um, not the final problem. Sorry, the the, the first world war story. I thought it just slipped my mind. Oh. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yes. But that that that's a, that is a, that is a, another talk in its own right. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. You you mentioned that you also do some other talks, or I did when I introduced you, like an HG Well or Walk, sorry, HG Wells one and, and things like that. Uh, what are some of your other ones? Just uh, just kind of curious to hear about them. Right. Well, the, well, the, well, the one I'm most proud out of it is is my Civil War connections around St Paul's and Cheapside, um, in which I, I I got a book out of that. 
And it's quite extraordinary because um, during the civil wars, there was no there was no battles in London. It was it was held it was held by the parliamentarians, um, but unlike, unlike other, other, other towns and cities, there, 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 there was there were no battles. Although there there may have been um, scuffles between between rival groups, but, but nothing nothing as serious as nothing as serious as, as a pitched battle. Um, and and then I, I have another walk, as you say, the the, the, the HG Wells. In which we 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 start up um, in in Bloomsbury and wind all the way back down through the through the through the city of London, just just looking at all the London connections of H.G. Wells, and and there are and there are an awful awful lot of them, far far far, far too many to men to mention, um, and the, and the and the doc and the Doctor Who walk, it's quite it's quite fascinating. To, to go around the streets and see, well, this is where they filmed Doctor Who, both the classic Who and 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 the modern Who. That's very cool. Very cool. Other questions for Robin? So, are there any? Uh... Sherlockian locations where you're like, okay, this happened in Red Headed League, and this is where the Cybermen invaded, and this is where Wells's time machine was built. Does anything all like sort of converge? Yes, there are a few. There are a couple. A couple of cutover points, um, and here, here, here we have a little bit of hulock because it, it's mainly on one of my other walks. The man accused of murdering himself, and. And, and it won't take you longer than five seconds to work out which story that refers to. And 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 the doctor and the Doctor Who walk. Hmm. Nice. Um, my question is that every time I've been to London, I've been to the Sherlock Holmes pub. And um, I'd like to have a different location to go to. Um, to experience some authentic Sherlock Holmes ambience and food, uh, where would you recommend? Oh, there's lots. There's lots of places um, you can get. You can get food at the Black Friar. But if you're going for lunch, be there very early because it's a very small pub and it does and it does fill up. There's also the um, the Old Bell in Fleet Street. And you can also try the old Cheshire cheese further along Fleet Street, which is which is in fact the writers' pub. And that's that's where all the all, all the writers used to, all the writers used to hang out. Robin, can you recommend some good contemporary to Holmes's time London directories? that would give us a sense of businesses and um, other things that were on these streets during the period. Um, yes, yes, in the, in the Bishopsgate Library in the, to, the, to, the, to the north of the city, you, 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 they, 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 do, they do have um, street, direct, street directories, some, some of them going back to the 1890s in, in their special collection. You know if any of these would have been digitized on and are online? I'd have to look. I'd have to look into that one. But but I will. I will make a point. Make a, a note of it. Thank you. When I'm writing my uh, pastiches, I'm always looking for contemporary information to make them as realistic as I can. And sometimes I've had to fudge because you know I'll find something for. 1870 and my story set in 1889 you know so you do what you can but um you know the more information to that line i have the better i can make my stories yes I, yes I, I i i can i can perfectly relate to that both as, as, as a historian and and, and the guy it's, it's very it's very important that you that you get the 
the, the background facts in place and, and, and nailed down. Well, and it so much helps in the writing of the stories because uh, that kind of thing can suggest plot lines and that you may not have even thought of. Yes. There are, there are a couple of books. Um, there was an exhibition a few years, quite a few years back, um, about the history of London and the and the, and the British Library published a book called London, A Life in Maps. It's well worth sourcing that. Um, question. Uh, how does one become a tour guide for these areas? Is there a professional association or is it independent businesses or does London itself have a hand in uh, qualifying people to do tours. Right, okay. Um, it works on it works on two levels. First of all, tour guiding is not generally regulated by regulated by law. You can be you can be an independent tour guide and you don't have to be qualified. Um, there are and there are and there are um, I would say professional organisations. I'm a member of one, the City of London Guide Lecturers, where you have to take a you have to take an academic um, course of course of study, and and and, the, and there's a written exam. You have to I had to I had to write five essays, or sh five short essays, answer fifty quick fire questions, and there's a test walk which is both internal. In in, in my case, it was in, in inside the guild hall. And also external out on the out on out on the street. And the benefits of and the benefits of being one of one of the um, the members of the organisation is first first of all you get you get a badge so you can prove your you can prove you're qualified. You you you, you get in, you get insurance, which is, which is vital, and you also get a lot of help and support from from, from your fellow guides. Yes, because um, I'd heard so much about how much training the uh, London taxi drivers have to do. So I was wondering if there was something similar with the tour guides. But it sounds like a bit like it. So, sort of. Um, some, 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 some London taxi drivers are, in fact, tour, tour guides themselves. Oh. That makes sense. Has the uh, Sherlock Holmes Museum been completely revamped? I, I, um, I, I believe it has. I, I, I wasn't. Um, I was there. I was there last year. So we'll, now, now things are starting to open up again. I'll go and find out for myself. Uh, yeah. um, Robin, I was wondering. One of the, I mean, Fleet Street is such a big part of this particular story, and it was a very, very busy um, street in, in the time period that, that this takes place. Um, could they really have fit all those redheaded people <laughs> in that area uh, at that time with all the regular traffic going on? Oh, I was reading up on this in the annotated Sherlock Holmes. And in one, and in one of the um, annotated paragraphs, it said that um, Dorothy L. Sayers has analysed and analysed this problem, and con and concluded that the adventure actually took place on an August bank holiday, when Fleet Street would have would have been empty, and so there would be an ample ample space to accommodate this red-headed flash mob. That also might explain why this wasn't in any of the papers at the time, right? right. <laughs> it was Absolutely. a bank holiday. Hmm. Uh, a what few, other, a few uh, other questions. I see a couple people have unmuted, so jump, jump on in. When, when you were pointing out places for that Lee had asked for new places to go to, is Simpson still in existence? What, Simpsons in the Strand or Simpson? Yeah, or, the, the, yes. The yeah. Oh, yes. I mean, would that be somewhere you'd recommend? Um, I, well, well, I could, I could, I could recommend if you can afford it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
because I, 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 I have been to Simpsons in the, in the Strand for, for, for an office Christmas meal. And, and it was a, and it was, and it was certainly the the, the highlight of, of of a of a busy December. Well, How would a vegetarian do there? Mm-hmm. Oh, I believe they cater for everything. Uh. I'd like to propose a theory for all those redheads in London. The story <laughs> was set in March, which is traditionally the month of Saint Patrick's Day. And as we know, the Irish and Scottish have a lot of redheads. So maybe they were also in London for that. And they have red noses too. There you go. (laughs) It is quite possible if um, Colin and Dora may may have flipped the dates over. The dates are a bit of a mess in this story. So that that might make sense. Yeah. Or maybe Watson screwed up. He's done it before. <laughs> when I did this walk a couple of years ago, the lady on the walk asked me if Conan Doyle was having a little joke at, at Redheads. Um, I don't know the answer. To, I don't know the answer to that one, but there would have been a young man with, with red hair at, at the time. He'd have been a teenager and he went on to become rather famous. And can you guess who he might be? Anyone? Mm. Elton John? No. Mm-hmm. Too, too early for him. Oh. Okay, I'll put you out of your misery. It was Winston Churchill. Oh, yeah. Really? Not many, yes, he, 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 he was a redhead. At least while he had hair. Oh. <laughs> no kidding. I have uh, just, a, just an opinion question for you, Robin. So this, this, you know, is often, the Redhead League is usually considered, you know, number one or number two. For Sherlock Holmes stories. I mean, generally speaking, this is this and, and maybe Speckled Banner are probably the two most popular Holmes stories. Why do you think this one stands out so much out of the 60 in the canon? Why is this so popular? Um, why is this so popular? I think because Holmes basically solves it in 50 minutes and just spends the rest of the day just testing his theories. He, 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 thinks out the, he thinks out the answer and then, and then gets confirmation. Do you, think the, do you think the locations of, because there are so many cool ones. I mean, you made a whole tour about it. Do you think that has... Uh, Anything to do with why it's so popular? Because I mean, I feel like London really comes alive in this story, or at least parts of London do. I think without those locations, you would you wouldn't you wouldn't have a story. It's it's um, it's a lot better than the story that came before it, a case of identity, and and in fact we are uh, we are indebted to the Red Headed League because it helps us pin down the date for the case of identity because it's cross-referenced in the opening um, opening lines, the case of Mary Sutherland, which we looked at the other day, which strongly suggests that the case of identity took place in the last couple of days of September or the first few days of October, 1890. It's also interesting that Holmes says directly that he makes a hobby of having a rather exact knowledge of London, meaning what's on each block. Mm. Uh, And, um, you know, he certainly shows that in his deductions, probably what he's ruminating about uh, over those pipes that he smokes so quickly. Absolutely, absolutely. And two, two good points there. Um, he, he's, he's thinking about the locations 
and when and when and when they were having a look around Saxe Coburg Square, he 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 just refreshing his memory as to the as to the exact layout. And a good and, and the, it's a good point about the pipes. Three pipes of tobacco in fifty minutes is some serious smoking. Unless, of course, it's the type of pipe known as a church warden, which had a long, a long stem and a very small bowl. And the purpose of the long stem was to cool the smoke. So, so you so you absorb more of the flavor. And it's and it's a sort of thinking, thinking smoke rather than a sort of, oh, I need this quick, quick tobacco fix smoke. That's a good point because it was a clay pipe. Which a church warden is, is it not? Yeah, that makes sense. I understand uh, Holmes and Watson took a break when they were at uh, to eat when they were at Coburn Square. Would they have gone to the vegetarian restaurant? Do you think? Um, maybe <laughs> if the vegetarian restaurant sold sandwiches. Yeah. Who knows? Mm. Probably have time for maybe one more question for Robin or one more comment uh, before we wrap up. If anyone wants to dive on in? Um, question. Various stories mentioned that Holmes had various bolt holes around London when he was out doing some of his uh, undercover work. Were those ever precisely identified as to locations or were they just non-specific mentions? As far as I can remember, I'm not, and it is actually something that I'm, look, that I'm looking into, um, that I, 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 think, I think they're, non, they're non-specific. I think it's fairly safe to assume that Holmes had, had at least one safe house to coin up to coin a phrase um even if it's only a, even if it's only a place where, where he kept his all his disguises hmm. makes sense all right of, oh go ahead brian no i was going to say in one of my stories i placed one in rathbone square i just couldn't resist Nice. All right. Um, I want to thank Robin because we're pretty much getting to the point where we're out of time here. I want to, yeah, a good virtual round of applause for Robin. It was a oh. wonderful talk. Um, thank you. Really can't wait to get across the pond, hopefully in about a year, and uh, going on some of your walks, my friend. Um, um, and uh, I will, when we're done here, I'll send an email out to the, to the list and I will uh, have uh, Robin's um, contact information as well as the uh, Tours of London website. Um, I know when, when we go away from uh, the Zoom, the chat goes away as well. So I'll make sure we get all that information out. Uh, also, the uh, book he recommended, London Life and Maps, I saw uh, Nancy said that she just ordered it, and uh, if you look, there's quite a few. I, I did a quick look while you were talking as well, <laughs> Nancy and I were thinking alike. Um, and there's a number of uh, both new and, and some used copies that are very inexpensive. So uh, if you are interested um, in, in getting that book, it looks like it is available. Uh, the recording of this will go live. Hopefully, I'll have this up pretty soon. Um, and then next month, uh, Hal Glatzer, who is a um, Sherlockian who lives in Hawaii, uh, is going to give a talk on Doyle's Dozen. So the 12 uh, home stories that Sir Arthur thought were his best. And so that's coming up for our April meeting. Um, I'll send, I'm sorry, May hey. meeting, sorry. <laughs> uh, wow, I can't believe how fast this year is going. I will send um, information out to the group on that. And then I will also, as I said, send information on uh, for Robin's contact. I highly recommend if you are in London or traveling to London, uh, take one of Robin's tours. You could actually walk this one uh, with our guide here, which would be just outstanding. 
Um, all right, everyone. I want to thank you, especially you, Robin. Uh, oh, thank you. This was just wonderful. And I will uh, see everybody uh, that you can make it in May. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Bye.